The subcommittee will come to order. The chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. Today's hearing relates to the 21st Century Cures Initiative announced by the Energy and Commerce Committee on April 30th, 2014. This Cures effort is envisioned to explore ways to accelerate the discovery, development, and delivery cycle for new medical breakthroughs. Through this effort, Congress hopes to clear a path to find more cures and treatments while also creating jobs and keeping America as the innovation center of the world. Shortly following the announcement of the Cures Initiative, the committee issued a white paper on May 1, 2014, entitled 21st Century Cures, a Call for Action, which more fully discusses the ideas behind the Cures Project and issues a call to action, a call for ideas. <clears throat> the first goal of this project is to solicit ideas. Yeah. Congress does not have all the answers, but we do have a role to play <clears throat> in ensuring our nation's laws and regulations keep pace and complement the biomedical research and innovation that is happening at lightning speed. Earlier this month, we heard from the NIH, FDA, patient advocates, university leaders, and other scientific pioneers about their ideas, challenges, and successes. Today, we will hear from experts who contributed to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. PCAST, report on propelling innovation in drug discovery, development, and evaluation. This important report hits on a number of topics that we will have to explore if we are to truly advance cures. These ideas include, among others, making sure incentives are in place to ensure capital is flowing towards research and development of new cures and designing clinical trials to the appropriate size and scale given the growth of targeted personalized medicine. Today, we hope to learn more about these proposals and others put forth by PCAST and determine which ideas or recommendations could potentially advance the 21st Century Cures Initiative. Excitingly, <clears throat> the fight for faster cures in the 21st century will not only foster medical innovations, but it can also make our health care system more efficient and can save lives. I want to welcome our witnesses today. Look forward to hearing, learning more about the advancements in biomedical research and innovation. And I ask for unanimous consent to include the following statements for today's hearing record from Dr. Raymond Woosley, former president of the Critical Path Institute, and one of the experts that participated in the development of the PCAST report, and Dr. Janet Woodcock, director of FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation Research blog post, quote, progress on the 2012 drug innovation report by PCAST, end quote, from May 20th, 2014. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I yield the remainder of my time to... Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for yielding. Thank you for having this hearing, and especially thanks to the Chairman and Ranking Member of the full committee for pursuing the 21st Century Cures agenda. So this is an accompanying bipartisan effort to listen to you, the scientists, to listen to doctors, listen to researchers, listen to patients, and yes, we'll listen to government agencies to find out how we can continue to lead the world in scientific discovery that ultimately leads to cures, treatments, medical devices that will improve human health and most importantly, alleviate human suffering. In September 2012, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology issued a report to the President on propelling innovation in drug discovery, development, and evaluation. The report provided recommendations on how to ensure we are doing everything we can to capture the significant amount of knowledge that has been gained in the last few decades and to ensure that the knowledge is translated into cures and actually make it into the lives of patients. The report found many of the same themes that we have heard for the last 10 years in this committee. While our scientific knowledge has significantly grown, the promise of that knowledge has not been realized. The recommendations of the 
uh, President's Council also mirror familiar suggestions, including building off existing authorities to accelerate therapeutics and ensure management of regulatory agencies appropriately balances the benefits and risk. With this effort, when this effort was launched, we said we wanted to hear from everyone, and I am pleased that we are evaluating the advice that is being given to the President in this area. I certainly look forward to this hearing. I look forward to your testimony. I look forward to uh, all of the participation of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Pallone, five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, and thank you for calling this hearing. I wanted to initially ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a, uh, an article uh, on the progress of the 2012 Drug Innovation Report by PCAST, if I could. I believe you have it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we, we just uh, we did that. All right, thank you. Um, let me also thank Chairman Upton for convening the 21st Century Cures Initiative, um, and also Ms. DeGette, uh, who was very much involved with that. We all agree that the federal government and Congress can play a role to help accelerate the discovery, development, and delivery of promising new treatments to patients, and the question remains how to best advance those goals. I look forward to engaging in this process as we meet with stakeholders and gather ideas and input from experts on what, if any, policies Congress can consider moving forward. And most importantly, I look forward to working with my colleagues in a bipartisan way to ensure that promising new medicines get to patients in a timely manner and they're safe and effective. The committee already has a great record on that effort, most recently with the passage of the FDA Safety and Innovation Act of 2012, or, or FDACIA. That law reformed and revitalized many FDA programs to improve its regulatory scheme to facilitate a more efficient and predictable review process. Specifically, we updated the regulatory pathways under which FDA provides for expedited reviews of drugs. We also added for the first time the break through therapy pathway, and all of these programs serve the goal of helping drug sponsors and the FDA work together to cut development time. In addition, I'm currently working with Chairman Pitts on a bill that would streamline the DEA scheduling process as it relates to approved drug therapies. If we're going to have a comprehensive discussion about how to promote innovation and medical advancements, we can't simply focus on the FDA. The work being done at NIH and through the country at research universities like uh, my hometown school of Rutgers University has to be properly funded. Discovering cures and developing effective treatments are complex, difficult, and expensive endeavors. NIH is the premier biomedical research institution in the world, and I hope this committee can find ways to ensure that NIH, NIH has the necessary tools to maintain that designation. When we talk about the delivery of therapies, we've got to address access. Medical advances and cures at the earliest possible time is our shared goal. But we all must work together to ensure that when discovered, those cures can get to all patients and not just those who can afford them. So, Mr. Chairman, based on your comments and actions to date, I'm hopeful we will have these conversations as a couple months uh, following the passage of FDASIA, uh, puts forth a number of proposals
crisis is bigger and more urgent than AIDS epidemic of the 1980s, and without swift and significant action, the implications will be devastating. The GAIN Act was an important step to address addressing a lack of new drug development, but it must not be the last. Weekly reports of new global threats and cases identified here at home are a stark reminder that our ability to meet this threat relies in no small part upon a robust pipeline and new therapies. PCAS scientists, physicians, and global health leaders have sounded the alarm. We need new incentives and approaches to continue fighting drug-resistant bacteria that build on the work and build on the work of, that GAIN started. It would, be, it would be wrong to let this opportunity for action pass us by. I urge the committee to address this crisis head on and encourage meaningful development of the anti, uh, antibiotic space. I stand ready to work with you to achieve the worthy goal, and we do not have a, we do not have a moment to waste, and I yield back my time. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the uh, chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so today marks our first 21st Century Cures hearing at the Health Subcommittee. We launched this bipartisan initiative earlier this month with one primary goal, accelerate the pace of the discovery, development, and delivery cycle so that we can get innovative new cures and treatments to patients more quickly. Today, we continue this important conversation with several of the distinguished experts who contributed to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Tech Report on Drug Innovation. The President, in soliciting recommendations on this very important topic, decided propelling drug innovation is, is a policy worthy of exploring and advancing, and I couldn't agree more. In their report, the President's advisors found that the nation's biomedical innovation ecosystem is under significant stress, citing the, patient, citing the patent, patent cliff facing the pharmaceutical industry, declining investment from venture capital, and decreasing research and development in critical areas, including Alzheimer's. We have heard similar concern in our discussion with patients, innovators, and thought leaders. So in order to address these issues facing our biomedical innovation ecosystem, the experts who contributed to the report recommended closing scientific knowledge gaps, addressing inefficiencies in clinical trials, considering more economic initiatives to decrease investment, to, to, to increase investment, and encouraging even more innovation at the FDA. The President's advisors put forth the following goal for our nation, quote, Double the current annual output of innovative new medicines for patients with important unmet medical needs while increasing drug efficacy and safety through industry, academia, and government working together to double the efficiency of drug development by decreasing clinical failure, clinical trial costs, time to market, and regulatory uncertainty. I know that we can all agree to join the president and his advisors to meet that goal. As the President Advisor so rightly said, we must work together to achieve the goal. This has to be a collaborative effort. The committee recently put out a call for feedback on the PCAST report. We also asked for input from our nation's patients on the discovery of treatment and cures for their diseases. The 21st Century Cures Initiative ultimately touches everybody, every family. Patients, doctors, loved ones, researchers, thought leaders, everyone and we want input from all of those involved. Pe folks can email their ideas to cures at mail.house.gov and contribute to the conversation on Twitter and Facebook using hashtag path to cures. Together, I know that we can provide hope to patients and families across our great country and keep America at the forefront of innovation and, by the way, create lots more jobs too. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we continue our work on the 21st Century Cures Initiative. Uh, these hearings are important. We need to ensure that patients gain access to new treatment and cures at the earliest possible time. At the same time, we need to recognize the strengths of our current system, which has led to enormous breakthroughs in drugs and devices. FDA reviews and approves drugs faster than any other regulatory agency in the world. NIH and FDA are world leaders in clinical trial design and in integrating the newest science into their policies and approaches. And our system protects the health of patients. It's critical that we avoid any attempt to fix things that aren't broken. 
and in the process do harm to a system that is already working very well. We should create policies that foster scientific advances, but we should do so in a way that does not jeopardize public health. Across the board, when we had an informal meeting, uh, participants at the roundtable two weeks ago said that we need to assure that NIH has the resources necessary to maintain its national and international leadership in biomedical research. And I would welcome an opportunity to work with Chairman Upton and all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle on accomplishing that goal. The participants at that roundtable also indicated that FDA was generally excelling in drug, drug and device oversight, and I was glad to hear that investment in the life sciences was booming. And Mr. Leff, one of the people there, attributed that success, at least in part, to some of the reforms we put into place in the 2012 FDA Safety and Innovation Act. The PCAST report makes several recommendations relating to FDA. There are two I would particularly like to learn more about. One is the recommendation that FDA or Congress develop new voluntary pathway to facilitate the approval of drugs for special medical uses based on smaller clinical trials than would be needed for broader uses. A bipartisan bill is introduced that would create such a pathway for antibiotics for serious or life-threatening infections for which there are few, if any, other options. This is an area of increasingly dire need, and I think this bill warrants serious consideration. As written, however, it does not achieve what PCAS described as an essential component of the pathway, that the drug's labeling send a clear and effective signal that it should be reserved for use in the specific subgroup of patients for which it was approved. I'd be interested in our witnesses uh, telling us their views on this issue. The other recommendation is the FDA undertake pilot projects to explore certain kinds of provisional approval pathways. These so-called so adaptive approval pathways shift more of the data requirements to post-market studies. However, PCAS recommended that Congress not legislate in this area yet because serious questions still need to be addressed. These include appropriate evidentiary, ev evidentiary standards, uh, protections of patients, and the ability to ensure that drugs are withdrawn if their effectiveness is not subsequently demonstrated. I'd like to hear more about that. I was disappointed that FDA and NIH were not invited to participate in today's hearing. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, that you entered the FDA blog into the record. It shows the significant progress FDA has made in meeting the recommendations of a PCAS report. And I'd like to now yield the balance of my time to our colleague, uh, Mr. Gett, from the State of Colorado. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Waxman, and thanks, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology Report on Drug Innovation. As, as has been mentioned, I've joined with Chairman Upton to launch the 21st Century Cures Initiative about a month ago. We had a very successful kickoff roundtable with other members of this committee where we heard from a number of experts, thought leaders from the administration, academia, research, and industry to dig deep into how we can effectively and efficiently tackle some of the more complex challenges in medicine. As the next step in this endeavor, it was important to consider what types of recommendations relating to research and innovation have already been proposed. The report that we discussed today, as has been mentioned, provides eight recommendations, ranging from federal funding for basic biomedical research to improved drug evaluation. The report also highlighted what can happen when lawmakers work together on a bipartisan basis to pass legislation that addresses emerging medical needs. There are several bills that I support which have been mentioned both by the witnesses in their testimony as well as the other me uh, members today. A couple of them that have not been mentioned are the Antibiotic Development to Advance Patient Treatment or ADAPT Act and the Regenerative Medicine Promotion Act of 2014, of which I'm the prime sponsor. So there's a lot going on. I think the testimony today will be a good step along our path to figure out how we can work together towards research and innovation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlelady. That concludes the opening statements. Uh, but opening statements, all the other members will be made part of the record. We have one panel with us today, five witnesses, and I'll introduce them in the order that they speak. 
Dr. Gary Neal, Global Head of Research and Development for Medgenics. Ms. Sarah Radcliffe, Executive Vice President and Biotechnology Industry Organization. Mr. Frank Sasanowski, Director, Hyman Phelps and McNamara. Mr. Jeff Allen, Executive Director, Friends of Cancer Research. Dr. Sean Tunis, Founder and CEO of Center for Medical Technology uh, Policy. Thank you for coming. Um, your written testimony will be made a part of the record. You'll be each given five minutes to summarize your testimony. And Dr. Neal, we'll start with you. You're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Push the uh, button. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, Ranking Member Waxman, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you this morning. My name is Gary Neal, and I head research and development in Medgenix, a small biotechnology company in Wayne, Pennsylvania, with operations in the U.S. and in Israel. My colleagues and I are working to bring novel ex vivo gene therapies to patients with serious, rare, and orphan diseases. I'm a physician and have spent the past 30 years in biomedical research and academia in industry, where I've worked in both large and small companies. I've also spent time in venture capital, and I've been engaged with a number of nonprofit organizations in support of the missions of FDA, NIH, and industrial research and development. And these include the Foundation for the NIH, the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA, the Biomarkers Consortium, and Transcelerate Biomedical, an industry collaboration I helped found in 2012. I provided expert input into the 2012 PCAST report, and I'm here today representing myself. The American biomedical research and development ecosystem remains the envy of the world. Its value is immense, and I, I'm sure that all of us in this room have benefited from medical innovation driven by that system in some way or other. Biomedical innovation employs nearly one million people in the U.S., and exports from the biopharmaceutical industry reached nearly $47 billion in 2010. But beyond the economic impact it provides, increasingly effective treatments and hope for patients everywhere. The PCAST report identified a series of challenges and obstacles that continue to raise costs, lengthen timelines, and increase risk, including difficulties in translating basic scientific discoveries into therapies, inefficiency of clinical trials, and the need to streamline the regulatory process, as well as the need to ensure that appropriate incentives are in place to encourage investment in U.S. biomedical research. But since the release of that report, a number of important developments have occurred demonstrating the resilience of the system. The FDA Safety and Innovation Act of 2012 expanded the use of accelerated approval and introduced a new breakthrough designation, both very helpful. Transcelerate Biomedical, as I mentioned, was launched as an industry collaboration to improve the efficiency of clinical trials. It currently has 16 member companies and has embarked on a number of projects aimed at reducing operational bottlenecks faced by all sponsors. Early results are extremely encouraging. The Accelerating Medicines Partnership, a public-private partnership between NIH, the pharmaceutical industry, and patient advocacy groups, was established and will address Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and others. At the Reagan Udall Foundation, a public-private partnership created by Congress to support regulatory science, post-marketing safety surveillance is being advanced by the Innovation in Medical Evidence Development and Surveillance Project. And as Mr. Waxman noted, venture capital investment in biomedical research has started to increase again. Biotechnology investment dollars rose 8% in 2013 to $4.5 billion. These are encouraging signs, but much more needs to be done if we're going to reach the ambitious goals set in the PCAST report and maintain our global leadership in life sciences as well as address the health care challenges that confront the country now. Uh, additional help and leadership from Congress on this would be tremendously beneficial. And areas for Congress to target include facilitating the creation of clinical trial networks, investing in new biomarkers and clinical trial endpoints, increasing and sustaining funding for both FDA, FDA and NIH, expansion of public-private partnerships to support the scientific missions of both FDA and NIH, providing FDA with increased flexibility to accelerate programs for life-saving medicines, and examining existing incentives for capital investment in biomedical research. 
Our company, like hundreds of other small, innovative companies, faces many of these challenges every day. Our scientists, like virtually all industry scientists, are incredibly dedicated, driven, and focused. Their ingenuity and problem solving amazes me every day, and we're making rapid progress. We rely heavily upon collaboration with academic scientists who advise us, and also upon the regulators who help us to find the path forward. We also rely upon our investors. They risk their capital because they believe we will succeed. Clearly, there's no time or resource to spare. We weigh every decision, every experiment with the utmost care. We understand the implications for our people, our investors, the country, but most importantly for the patients and their parents who are desperately waiting for cures. I applaud the committee for undertaking this effort in the sincere belief that it can result in positive change. Enlightened science-driven policy will allow companies like Medgenix to succeed put the next generation of transformational therapies in the hands of caregivers around the world and increase the competitiveness and prosperity of our country. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize Ms. Radcliffe, five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the committee, my name is Sara Radcliffe, and I am the Executive Vice President for Health of the Biotechnology Industry Organization, BIO. I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. BIO is the world's largest trade association representing over 1,000 biotechnology companies, academic institutions, and state biotechnology centers across the United States. BIO applauds Chairman Upton, Representative Diana DeGette, and the committee members for undertaking the 21st Century Cures Initiative to examine what steps Congress can take to accelerate the pace of discovering and developing cures. We are excited to work with you to keep America the innovation capital of the world. We also applaud the committee for holding a hearing on the PCAST report on drug innovation. It is critical that even in an environment of budgetary constraint, we do not yield to global competition and lose the next generation of discoveries that could treat or cure the myriad of chronic and life-threatening diseases. From an emotional point of view, we have a duty to work to end the suffering these diseases cause. From an economic point of view, the U.S. can't afford to lose these advancements. Medicare spent over $100 billion in 2012 caring for individuals suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and the expense is only going to increase. By 2030, almost one out of every five Americans, some 72 million people, will be 65 years or older. If we could delay the onset of Alzheimer's by just five years, we would save $50 billion per year. We have a national imperative to find new solutions, and this can only be accomplished if we all work together to create and defend policies that protect intellectual property, empower regulatory agencies to keep pace with science, encourage the development and adoption of modern approaches to drug development, promote a robust reimbursement environment, and continue to incentivize investment in scientific research. The PCAST report noted that the overall efficiency of pharmaceutical R&D efforts has been declining steadily for more than 50 years. While there are many contributing factors, it is widely recognized that increasing timelines and costs associated with clinical trials are key issues. More efficient clinical trials will reduce barriers to market for safe, innovative medicines. In 2012, BIO launched our Clinical Modernization Initiative to address four priority clinical research-related issues, some of which were also highlighted in the PCAST report. First, the use of centralized institutional review boards to promote greater efficiency, consistency, and quality of ethical oversight for multicenter clinical trials. Next, improving the FDA qualification process for drug development tools, including biomarkers. Additionally, advancing efforts by patient advocacy networks medical centers, healthcare providers, and other stakeholders to develop clinical trial networks and collaborative partnerships that could realize greater efficiency, consistency, and quality in the conduct of clinical research. Finally, implementing a risk-based approach to clinical trial monitoring that leverages centralized data monitoring through electronic data capture uh, systems can lead to significant efficiencies for clinical trial sponsors. We would also like to applaud Congress for already having taken action on several of the PCAST recommendations with the passage of the Food and Drug Safety Innovation Act, FDASIA. For example, PCAST urged the FDA to expand the use of the accelerated approval pathway beyond the traditional areas of HIV, AIDS, and oncology, 
and to be more open to the use of surrogate endpoints and intermediate clinical endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit and that can be measured earlier in drug development pending post-market confirmation. Videja encourages FDA to utilize the accelerated approval program more broadly, which may result in fewer, smaller, or shorter clinical trials without compromising or altering the high standards of the FDA for the approval of drugs. FDA's draft guidance on expedited programs will be very useful to sponsors. However, we encourage the agency to further clarify the process for validating a novel endpoint and for FDA to, and sponsors to discuss potential surrogate or clinical endpoints earlier in drug development. The PCAST report notes that drug developers have expressed frustration that it is difficult to get clear and timely answers concerning the acceptability of specific predictors for accelerated approval. Without such clarity, the risk of employing such predictors during the lengthy drug development process is often too great to justify significant investment. Finally, there has been interest in an expedited approval process for medicines used for small populations. We look forward to continuing discussions with the committee on this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you our ideas. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. Now recognizes Mr. Sasanowski, five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you for inviting me to testify. I would like to introduce my colleagues, uh, Alex Veron and James uh, Valentine, who helped me prepare this testimony. My testimony draws on 31 years of aiding new medicines get to patients in need. My career started at FDA in 1983, and I have a special passion for helping on therapies for rare diseases because both my son and I have rare diseases. And I have been on the board of directors of NORD for the past 14 years. I am here today representing both myself and NORD. NORD for over 40 years has been the voice for the 30 million Americans with rare diseases. I will be presenting four proposals for you to consider. My first proposal is for FDA to adopt a practice of considering the appropriateness of accelerated approval for each new therapy. Both PCAST and FIDASIA exhort FDA to use its accelerated approval authority more. Last September, Alex Verand and I submitted to FDA our 65-page analysis of FDA's accelerated approvals. Our analysis shows that FDA knows how to use this authority and even how to use it flexibly, creatively, and nimbly. In my view, what is needed now is simply to give this accelerated approval pathway greater visibility so that it will be used more frequently for the benefit of patients, as was recommended by both PCAST and FIDASIA. So my first proposal is for this committee to encourage FDA to consider whether accelerated approval is appropriate for every new drug therapy that's brought by sponsors to the FDA. My second proposal is for sponsors and FDA to use intermediate clinical endpoints, also known by its acronym of ICE, more often to secure accelerated approval. Alex and I analyzed the FDA accelerated approval precedents according to the three major factors that FDA described in the document that Ms. Radcliffe just mentioned. It's June 2013 FDA guidance on expedited approvals. We analyzed the FDA approvals according to these three factors, and we found that two of these three factors are far less relevant to accelerated approvals when accelerated approval is based on intermediate clinical endpoints or ICE rather than surrogate endpoints. Therefore, the quantity of evidence that sponsors must acquire and present to FDA and that FDA then must review may be substantially reduced if more accelerated approvals are based on intermediate clinical endpoints or ICE. So, to get more medicines to patients faster this committee should encourage both sponsors and FDA simply to use more ICE. My third proposal is to tap into the statutory authority for approving drugs that Congress created and gave to FDA in the 1997 FADAMA law. This authority stated that FDA could approve a drug based on a single study with confirmatory evidence. Congress created this as an alternative to the standard Congress created in 1962 which has generally been interpreted to require two studies. This 1997 alternative authority has been almost universally overlooked by all stakeholders, academia, sponsors, patients, and even largely by the FDA as well. I now ask my colleagues to hold up a chart. This chart is in my written testimony in greater detail. 
But this committee could propose that this simple chart be used at FDA advisory committee and other FDA sponsor meetings and in other forums to ensure that all the existing authorities are considered by every stakeholder for every new drug. Notice that the second line identifies that 1997 statutory authority or standard of a single study with confirmatory evidence. And the fourth line ensures that all recognize the potential of accelerated approval. So this one simple chart could help accomplish both of my first and third proposals. Thank you, James and Alex. My fourth proposal is for the committee to encourage FDA to issue guidance on cumulative distribution analyses of clinical study results. This could help understand the clinical meaningfulness of a new therapy. PCAST recommended that FDA issue more guidances to communicate innovative advances in regulatory science, just like this one of cumulative distribution analyses. So I'm deeply honored by you to have been asked to appear before you today. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize Mr. Allen, five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Jeff Allen, Executive Director of Friends of Cancer Research, a think tank and advocacy organization dedicated to accelerating science and technology from bench to bedside. It's an honor to be here, and I'd also like to thank our founder and driving force, Ellen Siegel, who is here today as well. Today, I'd like to focus on a few of the key items identified within the report to the President by describing areas in which there has been significant progress and areas to which the committee might turn its atten attention and resources. One key challenge that the working group explored was improving drug regulation at FDA. The authority and tools to fulfill FDA's monumental responsibility continues to evolve to keep pace with current science. I'd like to provide a few examples that demonstrate this. In collaboration with our expert colleagues from FDA, NIH, patient advocacy, industry, and academia, we at Friends of Cancer Research proposed a series of approaches of how clinical testing could be modified to expedite the development of new targeted therapies that show dramatic clinical activity early in development. With the leadership of this committee and your colleagues in the Senate, the creation of the new FDA program called the Breakthrough Therapies designation was codified into law as part of the FDA Safety and Innovation Act. FDA has been rapidly implementing the program in many serious disease settings. And Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to report that in just two years, 178 requests for breakthrough designation have been submitted, 44 have been granted, and six breakthrough therapies have been approved. It's been estimated by some of the sponsors of the drugs that the breakthrough therapy program accelerated the development process by several years without compromising the long-held standards for safety and efficacy. The all-hands-on-deck approach demonstrates the importance of the public-private collaboration that the designation brings to enhance science-based regulation, translating to reduced development times, increased investment in the biotech sector, and the improved health of patients that previously had few treatment options. This is an incredible example of Congress putting partisan politics aside and acting deliberately to address one of our country's most pressing health issues. Another key component of the report to the President explored ways of addressing inefficiencies in clinical trial conduct. There is no doubt that our antiquated patchwork clinical trial system makes developing new treatments a cumbersome, expensive, and protracted process. To begin to address this issue directly and truly change the course of how trials are done, Friends of Cancer Research is spearheading a project working with a large, diverse set of partners from academia, industry, government, and advocacy to develop a modern-day clinical trial as innovative as the therapies it seeks to test. In this project, called LungMap, a master protocol will govern how multiple drugs, each targeting a different biomarker, will be tested as a potential treatment for lung cancer. Each arm of the study will test a different drug and utilize cutting-edge screening technology to identify which patient is a molecular match to each arm. This will create a rapidly evolving infrastructure that can simultaneously examine the safety and efficacy of multiple new drugs. LungMap has the ability to reinvigorate the research enterprise and rapidly facilitate the development of molecularly targeted medicine. This approach has the ability to improve enrollment, enhance consistency, increase efficiency, reduce cost, and most importantly, improve patient lives. One way that the FDA communicates to researchers and developers about new approaches or changes to current policy is through guidance documents, an interchange that is vital to modernizing the enterprise. The report recommends that external partnerships could be beneficial in providing input on scientific subjects that would be fit for guidance. Neutral public venues that can facilitate the exchange of ideas can greatly inform the topics and approaches that FDA may take when considering best practices and guidance development. 
Much like FDA benefits from hearing the challenges faced by the research community, the external community gains from hearing from FDA. Processes and adequate funding levels need to be established to increase FDA's ability to gain external input and develop new guidance. This has the ability to greatly enhance the success of research endeavors, encourage innovation, innovative collaborations, and can inform vital legislation. In addition to the elements raised in the report, we at Friends of Cancer Research believe that consideration should also be given to opportunities in the development of companion diagnostics. Building on the foundation that FDA has provided through recent guidance, this committee could facilitate new policies to advance how novel technologies can inform the use of new drugs to ensure that the right patients have access to the right treatments at the right time. The examples that I've provided today are case studies that can be learned from and are stepping stones upon which more work can be done. Innovation is incremental, but with better understanding of the disease processes, these incremental steps toward improving health can and will be transformational. The regulatory framework has been put into place and enhanced collaborations will be needed to uncover new breakthroughs and alleviate inefficiencies. Aligning policies with the current state of science can enhance biomedical research and improve the lives of patients. The 21st Century Cures Initiative can be the next step toward that goal. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Now recognizes Dr. Tunis, five minutes for an opening statement. Well, I'd also like to thank uh, Chairman Pitts, uh, Mr. Uh, Pallone, and the members of the subcommittee for the chance to testify today. Um, uh, again, my name is Sean Tunis. I'm currently the CEO of the Center for Medical Technology Policy. It's a nonprofit that works on uh, bringing together stakeholders to improve the quality and efficiency of clinical research. Um, I did serve as one of the invited experts uh, uh, to the PCAST uh, council members and staff. And because of my former role as uh, Chief Medical Officer for the Medicare program, I thought it would be most useful to reflect on these recommendations in the report from the perspective of uh, the payer and the health system. It wasn't directly addressed in the report, but a number of the recommendations have implications for um, the health delivery system that I think need to be thought through more carefully in order to ensure that the recommendations can be implemented uh, successfully. And I really think the, the kind of the key message I wanted to deliver and what it comes down to is that because many of the recommendations in the report essentially uh, shift evidence requirements and data development from the pre-market space to the post-market space, in other words, the delivery system, uh, it's going to be important to, uh, to think about how it's going to be possible to efficiently conduct clinical research in the post-market environment. In other words, how do we embed the evidence development that's not generated pre-approval uh, in the context of delivering clinical care. And so I'm going to offer three um, recommendations or suggestions about how that kind of evidence can be uh, uh, produced. Um, just to briefly uh, highlight the, the recommendations in the PCAST report that sort of have this effect essentially of shifting uh, clinical research and evidence development to the post-market space, of course, there's the increased use of accelerated approval. Uh, depends more on intermediate and surrogate markers, and therefore uh, ex the expectation is that more of the evidence of safety, effectiveness, and even value are going to be generated uh, while these products are in use in the delivery system. The special medical use as well as the, uh, uh, the adaptive um, licensing mechanisms also have the same uh, effect, which is, again, to, uh, to require the ability to do efficient uh, clinical uh, research and, and data collection in the post-market space. So in order for the PCAST recommendations, I think, to have the desired impact, which is to speed innovation and to do that in a way that doesn't in some way compromise the, uh, the expectation of safe, effective, and high-value medications in clinical use, uh, we're going to need, again, to think about how do we get that kind of data out of the delivery system. Um, as, as, uh, as members of the subcommittee uh, know very well, what's simultaneously going on to these innovation discussions is um, a lot of health systems reform that is increasingly um, pushing uh, payers and the health systems to be looking for improved effectiveness, real-world effectiveness, and even the value of new medications. So at the same time as uh, we're hoping to introduce new drugs into the healthcare system, with less information about safety and efficacy, we're also putting pressure on payers and providers and health systems to demand more evidence of comparative effectiveness and value in order to be able to deliver 
high quality and efficient care. So we've got some tension uh, between what we're trying to do on each ends of this policy spectrum. So um, about data development in post-market studies. And basically, um, I'll, I'll mention three, three uh, kind of components that I think are important to this. Um, the first one is uh, developing more clarity about what const and value. And so, in a sense, the whole world of regulatory science, which is all about giving product developers clear guidance uh, on clinical development, I think needs to be kind of uh, mirrored in something you might call reimbursement science, which is how do you develop evidence uh, for reimbursement decisions. Uh, the, the second recommendation is, um, uh, some people might think reimbursement science is an oxymoron, but uh, you know, possibly we'll make some progress. The second and third recommendation, since I'm running out of time, is uh, one is that we need to build infrastructure in the healthcare system to do better research. Um, the NIH is working on that. And finally, um, uh, we're going to need to find reimbursement mechanisms that are actually conditional uh, on collecting additional data. Medicare is used coverage with evidence development. There's other forms, but if we're actually going to be shifting these data collection requirements to post-approval, we need the payers to be willing to pay for things while they are being evaluated, much like the FDA has post-approval authority. I think the payers need to implement post-reimbursement authorities for to, at, to collect the additional data on safety and effectiveness. So thanks again for the opportunity to testify. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Thanks all the witnesses for their prepared testimony. We'll now begin questions and answers. Uh, I'll begin the questioning and recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Um, Dr. Neal, uh, the PCAST report notes that the pharmaceutical industry is facing the largest patent cliff in its history. As a result, many companies are adopting more conservative approaches to research and development, particularly in areas with growing health care and economic burden, such as neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and psychiatric diseases. Uh, what role could additional economic incentives play in driving R&D into these areas where there is a critical public health need? Dr. Neal. I think they could be extremely valuable in helping to offset some, some of the costs uh, associated with the risk and the length of time the, these programs require. I, I do think, though, that it may be as productive or more productive to invest uh, additional resources in things like uh, endpoints, um, intermediate clinical endpoints, clinical endpoints. Often we've found that as we try to study some of these neurodegenerative diseases, they, it's a very long time between onset and uh, an ultimate disability, and if, if that's what needs to be used as, as an endpoint, it, it makes the feasibility of these trials much lower. So we, we haven't done enough to, to really invest, I think, in creating such endpoints, and I'm thinking about Alzheimer's disease, I'm thinking about stroke as a couple of those, but there are many others, and some of the rarer neurodegenerative diseases have been inadequately studied with respect to their uh, natural history as well. So I think some targeted efforts there would, would also be uh, very helpful, as well as accelerating the pace of, of discovery work, where in diseases like schizophrenia, we've been out of really promising targets for some time. Okay. Ms. Radcliffe, um, what challenges do drug sponsors and the FDA face today in the use of uh, surrogate endpoints and biomarkers? And what are the current barriers to their more widespread adoption and use? And maybe you want to just, for the general public, um, uh, tell us what uh, biomarkers and points define them for us, too, briefly. Sure, absolutely. So. Uh, biomarkers and the, the terms biomarkers and endpoints are used uh, in various different ways in the scientific community. So I'm going to tell you the way in which I urge that, that um, we understand those terms. 
A biomarker is really a, a signal of, it's a biological signal of another biological process. It's, it's really that simple. A biomarker can be used in many different ways in research and development. For it to be used in the regulatory context, all parties have to have uh, a great confidence in the relationship between the, the uh, biological signal and the biological process that it is signaling. An endpoint in uh, regulatory terms, a clinical endpoint, is something that affects how a patient feels, functions, or survives. So uh, in, in, in uh, relatively simple terms, it's something that the patient will actually recognize. Um, a surrogate endpoint is a marker that can point toward the ultimate clinical benefit for a patient. So an example of that would be uh, viral load is a surrogate endpoint for treatment effect for HIV um, and AIDS drugs. An intermediate clinical endpoint is a clinical endpoint that can be measured earlier on in the disease process. Um, and so uh, an example of an intermediate clinical endpoint would be something that's called forced vital capacity. That is the ability for a patient to expel a large amount of uh, air, and it can be a good marker of progression and possibly treatment effect in neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and so the use of intermediate clinical endpoints can expedite drug development because you are now uh, working toward treatment of an endpoint that you're seeing earlier on in the disease process, and that may enable you to ward off um, further uh, effects further down the line in the disease process. So why is it important for, uh, for our companies? The use of surrogate endpoints and inter intermediate clinical endpoints can um, expedite drug development and enable us to get a product to patients earlier with smaller um, and shorter clinical trials. In terms of the obstacles that we face, um, as I said, there's not uh, the kind of clarity that we would like around what FDA will accept as a surrogate endpoint and what FDA will accept as an intermediate clinical endpoint. The evidentiary standards uh, that FDA um, is likely to require at this time really require a lot more discussion with the agency. And also just in terms of process, as I said in my, um, in my testimony, uh, there isn't at this time a, a good practice of companies and sponsors talking about intermediate clinical endpoints earlier on in the drug development process so that uh, you can really work toward the use of those endpoints as you develop your submission to the FDA. Chair, thanks, you, gentlelady. My time's expired and recognize the uh, ranking member five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to explore um, in some detail one of the recommendations from the PCAS report, specifically recommendation number three, which states that FDA should expand the use of its existing authorities for accelerated approval and for confirmatory evidence. And as I understand it, there are already a few pathways in the current law and regulations for the expedited review of drugs, including fast track, breakthrough therapy, accelerated approval, and priority review. And the goal of all these pathways is to speed the development and availability of new treatments to patients at the earliest possible time. Just a couple of years ago in the 2012 FDA Safety Innovation Act, we updated the fast track approval mechanism and established the breakthrough therapy path. And then, of course, the 21st Century Cures Initiative seems to have been prompted, at least in part, by what's been described as a regulatory system that is a relic of the past. But this is confusing to me because we just finished updating the system and providing FDA with new tools. So I also didn't hear anyone at this, the first roundtable with the 21st Century Cures Initiative who would describe FDA's drug re regulatory program as somehow out of date. So I'd like to hear more from our experts here today on how effectively FDA has been using these current authorities and where there might be room for improvement. First, let me ask Dr. Allen, your testimony describes FDA's use of the breakthrough therapy pathway, which sounds like it's been a real success. Can you say a little more about that and describe how FDA has used any of the other expedited review authorities with respect to cancer drugs? And have you identified any problems or issues in its application of these authorities? 
Sure. Well, I again want to thank the committee for their leadership in creating such a designation. Uh, the, um, the tools that FDA currently has uh, based on the 2012 law and others uh, have been widely used in cancer. I think uh, well over a third of uh, all anti-cancer drugs have uh, utilized the accelerated approval process, for, for example. So it, it certainly is valuable. The, uh, the purpose of the breakthrough therapy designation was to, um, as you say, um, Mr. Plone, to uh, advance and give the flexibility for FDA to respond to the current state of science because what we're seeing in oncology and many other genetically driven diseases is the ability to target different uh, genetic alterations and uh, stop the progression of the disease. And this calls for a different way of doing business. And we believe that's what the FDA is doing. And they have robustly implemented the new breakthrough therapies uh, uh, provision and are, are exercising it regula uh, regularly. I think it's worth noting um, the, the resource intensity of this program. Um, it certainly is serving its purpose of getting the most promising therapies uh, to patients, um, but the resources uh, required to do so are not insignificant. And I know there's a hearing uh, uh, elsewhere today considering uh, the, the funding for, um, for FDA, and I would encourage them to, to do what they can to, to support that. Um, I think the historic basis of, of uh, speaking to those regulations is because there were laws in 1960 that established the safety and efficacy standard, and those are extremely important that we uh, continue to uh, optimize regulation and drug development within those, within those important standards. All right, thanks. Mr. Sasanowski, your testimony also describes the ways in which FDA has used these authorities over the years, and it sounds like you would also say that FDA uses them frequently and prudently. Is, is that correct? Mr. Pallone, uh, uh, the, prudently, but not frequently. Uh, the analysis that my colleague, Alex Veranda, and I did, we looked at all of the FDA accelerated approvals for therapies other than cancer, and, and Mr. Allen's rights, often used in cancer. I was at FDA during the AIDS crisis, and so I was part of the group that helped create subpart H, which was very useful for stemming the AIDS crisis. So uh, accelerated approval has been used, but you'll notice in our PCAST report that you cite, Mr. Pallone, that 87, we say in the PCAST report, 87% of all the accelerated approvals have been for cancer and for AIDS. And so what Mr. Verone and I did is we looked at every accelerated approval from the mid-80s through June 2013. We found only 19 drugs that had been approved not for cancer, not for AIDS, uh, under accelerated approval. We found that the FDA did use accelerated approval appropriately in those 19 cases, but it was only 19 cases, Mr. Pallone, and that's why I think PCAS said we should use it more. I think that's why this committee in Congress said in FDASIA, FDA, use it more. That's why there are two women who I was surprised to see here who are in this room who have, between the two of them, three boys with DMD, Christine McSherry and Jane McNeary. And, and I know that they represent, as a member of NORD, they represent the kind of Americans who are suffering and who are looking for FDA to use accelerated approval more often for conditions that are not AIDS, not cancer. So I think appropriately they've used it, and that's why I suggest this chart, because I've been to thousands of FDA meetings since I left the FDA with sponsors. Seldom does the word subpart H, accelerated approval, or fast track ever get mentioned. People are not focused on it. That's why I urge you to consider exhorting the FDA through some simple mechanisms, like a chart, like at every advisory committee, when the chair of an advisory committee turns to the FDA and say, what are we supposed to do with this data? We know what the Congress's standard was in 1962, two adequate and well-controlled studies. This is a rare disease for so something like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We don't have two adequate and well-controlled studies, so what are we supposed to do? Well, there's a lot of hemming and hawing. And I think that if we had a chart like this that was uh, proposed that, that would summarize in a clear way that there are alternate authorities, like the 1997 authority that Congress created, which was the single study with confirmatory evidence, and I've explained that in great detail in my written testimony, that that would be very useful, as well as to remind everybody of accelerated approval. Mr. Pallone, I was at a hearing just last summer in August 2013 for a drug for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. My spiritual director had his nephew die of this disease. I know people who have died of this rare disease. It's a terrible disease. And yet, not once did anyone ever mention at that hearing the possibility of accelerated approval. Even though it's a serious disease, it's for a situation where there's no approved therapies, it's ripe 
for consideration under accelerated approval, just like PCAST, just like you and Fidesia said FDA should do, and yet it was never considered. So I'm struggling to think of ways, Mr. Pallone and the committee, to try to bring this forward in practical ways. And, and that's why I come up with something as simple as a chart. It might seem um, pedantic, it might seem trite, but I think sometimes simple things work. And so I, I, I think you're right when my analysis shows that the FDA has used this authority appropriately, prudently, but not frequently. And the other thing that's been completely overlooked is that single study with confirmatory evidence standard, which Congress created in 1997 and FDA seldom used. Thank you. Chair, thanks, you, gentlemen. Now recognize the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I actually appreciate that last part of your discussion, Dr. Sasinowski. Uh, you started the FDA just a couple of years after I started in private practice, and I can recall back in the 80s being frustrated by the fact that it seemed like there were new therapies that were available in Europe, and it took us forever to get them in this country. Of course, Chairman Waxman, or Ranking Member Waxman, deserves a lot of credit for starting the user fee agreements, which we reauthorized in, in the last Congress. Dr. Neal, I, I wanted to ask you just very quickly if you could, you mentioned that your company was involved in novel ex vivo gene therapies. Yes. Could you give us a synopsis or a summary of, without violating obviously proprietary interests, but can you tell us the, some of the directions that you're, in which you're working? Yes, uh, the core of our technology is something called the biopump. So we remove a small piece of dermis, the layer just below the skin, uh, about half the size of a toothpick, and we transduce that with a, with a viral vector to express a transgene, a protein that a patient with a rare and orphan disease might not express at all or might express in too low a quantity and it is causing their disease and they could benefit from having this, this restored. And after the transduction, all of the viral antigens are washed away and we reimplant this small piece of tissue back into the patient. So the patient effectively uh, manufactures their own protein that they could not manufacture before or in insufficient quantity, and that then um, it addresses, we hope, the, the, the disease in question. And we're aiming this technology at a number of rare and orphan diseases that could benefit. In addition to rare diseases, are there more common diseases that you're also working toward? Yes, that's very likely. But I, I think that we shouldn't overlook the fact that very often we can learn so much by studying a rare and orphan disease initially because the population is enriched, we understand the mechanisms much better, and then we can apply the lessons that we learn to the larger syndromic diseases. Since a lot of this panel or this, this hearing today d deals with the regulatory aspects, how is that how, how has your experience been then when you take this information back to the FDA for regulatory approval? Do they understand what you're doing? Are they able to give you the proper direction about how to structure your studies so that regulatory approval can be achieved? Yes, our interactions with FDA have been a little bit earlier than approval because we're just embarking on some of these programs uh, in the clinic. But those interactions have been very positive, and, and they seem very helpful and very interested in the technology. But we and other companies are now bringing to FDA a very novel therapies, which incorporate many different uh, elements, such as medical devices, uh, gene therapy, tissue transplant, and so on. And I, I think that, and, and, and I directed some of my testimony toward that, the increasing complexity of these types of treatments, something that FDA is going to need to invest in expertise that's, in. in that's culture. correct. I don't mean to interrupt you because I'm out of time, but that's correct. They don't have the expertise right. currently. They do have to develop it. Dr. Tunis, I, I really appreciated your uh, end of the discussion. Uh, you talked about from the payer aspect, from the CMS aspect, certainly we want to avoid the public relations disasters that were of Aston and Provenge from a year or two ago. And one of my concerns through a lot of the hearings that we've had here is anyone looking at the end use of this, I mean, okay, we've got NIH developing, we've got the FDA, which is going to regulate and or approve, but we also need to involve the payer at some point to let them know what's coming so that they can appropriately adjust. So I, I do appreciate you bringing that up, and I think oftentimes we overlook that aspect of the regulatory pathway. Yeah, um, 
You know, I think just to, just to point out, I think you know the payers are often viewed collectively as um, you know not in favor of innovation or somehow resistant to you know new technologies. And while you know there are certain uh, ways in which that's true, I think it's, it's also true that the health system understands that innovation is potentially a way to get better outcomes at even lower costs. You know, treating disease is obviously uh, you know cheaper than treating a, you know treating it f uh, forever is 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 cheaper than tr having to continue to treat it in an ongoing way. So the, 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 the challenge really is that, um, as I said, I do think the payers get left out of these conversations. There, there were a couple of payers on the PCAS committee, and, and again, most of the discussion about the, is about regulatory issues, but you know, a, a metaphor I use is you don't want to create this super highway of innovation in the regulatory space and then have a gravel road you know, in the reimbursement space for those. Uh, uh, I've you know, been down that gravel road. You know, when I was in medical school, uh, we learned about the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. It was a surgery, a highly selective vagotomy, a removal of part of your body. Um, but I also remember going to a luncheon meeting back in the 70s where Dr. Fortran from Dallas came down and talked about this new idea he had of a histamine blocker to deal with, with ulcer disease. And, of course, now half the country is on proton pump inhibitors, and the, the, the highly selective vagotomy is in the Smithsonian Institution. No one does them anymore. You'd have to go uh, – uh, it itself is a rare disease because you, no, no one has to have that anymore. It's hard – to get the say, you know, to, to be able to account for the savings that Dr. Fortran created with the development of his product, uh, because all of the baby boomers who at that point were in medical school but were on their way to developing ulcer disease would have required that surgery at some point in their future. To say nothing of then curative antibiotic therapy for Helicobacter pylori, which sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, he's, his gavel is the surrogate endpoint for my questioning. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll have a second round. <laughs> Chair, thanks, you, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank our witnesses for your testimony today. Without greater investment in antibiotics, we'll face a future that resembles the days before these miracle drugs were developed, uh, one in which people died of common infections and many medical advances that we take for granted today uh, would become impossible, including surgery, chemotherapy, and organ transplantation. Dr. Neal, you mentioned in your statement in the 2012 PCAST uh, recommended a limited population drug approval pathway in order to facilitate drug development. PCAST specifically identified antibiotics as an area where this pathway could, would be important. And as we know, the need for new antibiotics is urgent. Uh, the World Health Organization reiterated this, just this month on the report of antibiotic resistance, which said it's very real potential for post-antibiotic era in the, in the near future. My colleague, Dr. Gingery, and I have introduced the ADAPT Act, which would create the pathway uh, PCAST described. FDA officials from the commissioner down have talked about the urgency's desire to work with Congress to get this done. We're eager for Congress to quick act quickly and given the urgency of the situation. Dr. Neal, could you explain how this pathway would benefit antibiotic development? I, I uh, think that, yeah, it's on. I, I think it would benefit it tremendously. Um, not only de the development of it, but also the appropriate use of these uh, new drugs uh, once they get in into clinical use. But the idea that one can identify very easily through surrogate markers the appropriate population with a serious infection uh, and be able to address that much more quickly, speed these antibiotics to the market, I, I think is a terrific one. And not only that, I think what we learn from this and how to implement it can be applied to other serious diseases later on, potentially. Okay. Dr. Allen, cancer patients are a particular risk for serious bacterial infections. Patients undergoing chemotherapy or have suppressed immune systems, making it more difficult for them to fight off other diseases. Without antibiotics, chemotherapy would be significantly more dangerous. Dr. Allen, you talk about a limited population pathway for antibiotics. Could this could be important to cancer patients. Uh, can you talk to us about that? Sure. Well, uh, as you mentioned, and thank you for your leadership in this area, uh, risk of infection for cancer patients has certainly increased, and it has the potential to interrupt their treatment uh, on a chemotherapy or other anti-cancer drug that they may have to stop that treatment, and uh, it could have a, a detrimental effect toward uh, harnessing the growth of the cancer. 
even more detrimentally is if um, a cancer patient who is immune compromised is infected um, with um, with microbial infection, it, it poses them at at risk for serious adverse events and fatality. So it is not insignificant here, both in the treatment of uh, the cancer, but also in the survival of the patient. Okay. In 1990, there are almost 20 pharmaceutical companies with large antibiotic research and development programs. Today, there are only two or three large companies with strong active programs, and only a small number of companies have more limited programs. Uh, Ms. Ratcliffe, in your testimony, you mentioned that a, the ADAPT Act and the importance of the voluntary pathway can help foster novel drug development. Can you elaborate on how this kind of pathway would address some of the economic challenges, particularly the size, the cost, and time it takes to complete it, clinical trials that may be hindering antibiotic uh, investment in antibiotics? Yes, certainly. Bio supports the ADAPT Act, and we thank you very much, as well as uh, Representative Gingri for your work on developing this pathway. It has to walk a, a very fine line. Um, it is important that sponsors be able to seek the designation early or follow the pathway early on in development so that they can um, gain the benefits of being able to design a clinical pathway in a smaller population to work in this incredibly important area for Gentlemen, now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman. It's great to have you all here. Um, I've, I've been interested. There's a Washington Post story published May 16th on the, on the movement by states on right to try laws. Um, the, the one column, part of the end of the article, and Mr. Chairman, if we could submit it for the record, I want to Without objection, so um, There's a story about uh, uh, the spouse, Amy Alden, from Lone Tree, Colorado, who had a, her husband had melanoma, two-year battle. The last year they tried to get a promising drug, couldn't get it. He since passed. And her comment is, of course there was a chance Nick would have been in the 52% of the people who are responding to the drug. However, a 52% chance of life is better than a 0% chance of life, which was the dilemma that this family was placed in. And hence you see states moving to to address this uh, it's not what a brief comment on on this movement by states on, on to uh, right to try laws and that's probably symptomatic of a slow process of getting drug therapies quickly to the market is that true let's just go from left to right if you want and if you don't want to answer that's fine I mean it's, well, in, in my experience, FDA has always been uh, very compliant in uh, getting patients, you know, in, into small trials or, or, or compassionate use trials. The, to me, the issue is, has always been for smaller companies having the resources to be able to provide that. And I think we, mechanisms on this to wasn't a small company that uh, she yeah. had to deal with. So, well, um, yeah, I, I, th I think that the, there should be some way for companies to recover their cost and to get patients into trials and to be able to collect the information that, that you need uh, to make that uh, right. usable. And please kind of go quickly. I've got actually my two official questions <laughs> that I need to get to. Uh, so this is a, a very, very difficult issue. Bio has a board-level bioethics committee which is currently involved in taking a, a deep look 
at the issues around expanded access. I think everyone understands that if somebody uh, in their own family uh, were in such a uh, situation that they needed an investigational product, um, I think most of us would do everything that we could to. But it is a statement about the process yeah. uh, um, and, uh, and how slow and methodical and people who, I, it, it's, it's, it's happening. I mean, uh, it, these it, are three, there's three states. I think this Colorado one's going to be signed into law on Saturday from, from what I'm reading. And that's a response to people feel that they're not getting a chance to fight for their life and they're being held up either in the, in the, let me move forward. I, cause, um, I need, I need to move on on these two other questions, uh, on the president's council. Uh, raises the fact that in recent years there has been a regulatory uncertainty about a variety of important issues that has hindered investment and innovation. One such issue is combination of therapies and studies that are required for their approval. Has FDA since provided sufficient clarity in this area, or is there a need to ensure greater regulatory certainty for companies to spur further innovation in this increasingly important area of drug development? Anyone want to try it? I, I think there's there's further need, um, particularly outside of cancer, uh, to echo Mr. Sasanowski's comments earlier. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, you know, and I, and I would just add again, sort of related to some of the comments I made in my testimony, that the better equipped you know we are in the context of delivering health care to get the additional information about you know products that are approved through an accelerated pathway. I think the more the FDA can count on some of the unanswered questions about safety, you know, safety and effectiveness to be to be efficient to be answered at least at some point, and then the, the opportunity to to accelerate to use the accelerated authorities more frequently, I think, is enhanced as the delivery system gets better at filling in what's not uh, studied pre-market. Let me finish with this last question, and the rest I'll submit for the record. A second distinct area that report highlights which is of particular interest to me is the issue surrounding certainty and the regulatory pathway when it comes to therapies for which patients are picked based upon companion diagnostics. The companion diagnostic may or may not be approved already, adding an additional layer of complexity for the sponsor. Do any of you witnesses have experience in this area to comment on what needs to be done to encourage investment and innovation for these personalized approaches? The, the, the trial that I mentioned um, with regards to lung cancer is uh, working to try and advance these technologies through the regulatory process uh, by using new technologies that have the ability within a single test to monitor uh, the, um, the, the activity and presence of different genetic alterations. So it, it, it has the ability to really uh, reform the current uh, single test paradigm with a single drug. Um, but I think um, the, the FDA has been proactive in issuing guidance documents, both from the drug and diagnostic side, to, uh, to begin to lay out what their feelings are on how to generate this evidence. But some of this is also an artifact of making sure that there's a robust research enterprise to, uh, to really understand which are those uh, true alterations that are driving different diseases. Great. Thank you. My time is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Now recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, PCAST report's fourth recommendation is the uh, creation of a new uh, pathway that manufacturers could choose to use for initial approval of drugs shown to be safe and effective in a specific subgroup of patients. The report notes that such approvals could sometimes be based on relatively small and rapid clinical trials showing a favorable safety and effectiveness risk-benefit ratio for the narrow population most in need of the drug. However, it notes that for, for such a pathway to work, FDA would have to be confident that the drug generally would not be used beyond the limited population for which it was, eva it was uh, evaluated and intended. Dr. Allen, do you think the pathway makes sense if FDA does not have adequate authority to ensure that the designation is used to inform potential users and payers of the special standing and circumstances surrounding approval of the drug. I think it's important to um, uh, to state that the the intention of the limited population pathway is to still operate within the confines of uh, of safety and efficacy, and that's not altered. 
Um, I think that ensuring appropriate use of uh, these types of product, uh, products will require a, a great deal of interaction with the medical community and, make sure, and making sure that the appropriate lines of communications are present to make sure that the benefit risk uh, profile within that subset uh, is maintained and, and, and communicating clearly that the benefit risk for the entirety of the population may not be known yet. Um, but uh, those patients with the, uh, with the most life-threatening uh, uh, version of that, of that disease don't have the time to wait. So this allows uh, for, um, for, for access for those with the most severe form of a, of a relatively common illness. So you think that uh, if, if, they, if they have adequate authority to de designate this information, that that would be important if they're going to release this drug? before it's approved for the general population. Yes, certainly, and, and having the ability to communicate is largely based on the label, as, as it is with all prescription mm -hmm. drugs, but in this case, it would be important to indicate um, if, there is, if this has only been tested in the most severely ill, Ill patients through use of some sort of symbol mm -hmm. or, uh, or logo to communicate it, but also the ability to, um, to pre-review marketing material, and that's been an effective strategy in other areas, such as accelerated approval. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to another recommendation in the report. Recommendation five has to do with another new potential mechanism for more quickly making new therapies available to patients, the so-called adaptive approval. As I understand it, adaptive approval refers to the concept that there would be a series of approval stages that would gradually allow a new therapy to be marketed for broader patient population. So as more is learned about a drug, the use of it could be expanded. The PCAST apparently explored this concept extensively. However, in its final recommendation, it said that Congress should not legislate this new pathway. Instead, any use of this approach should instead be tested in pilot projects. Dr. Allen, can you say more about why PCAST was hesitant to have any legislation on this pathway at this point? And I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the entire work group, but um, you know, from from my perspective, it's it's very difficult uh, to have one uh, set of rules that governs a very diverse set of products. Um, and uh, given the pace at which science is accelerating, I, I think many of the um, the other um, witnesses on the panel today have have talked about uh, some really innovative approaches to different diseases. Um, and it's hard to really kind of draw a a, a, a single line in the sand. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a drug for prevention is very different than a drug for late-stage pancreatic cancer, and the benefit-risk profile of that is very different. Mm -hmm. And so it is hard to codify that into law. Mr. Sazanowski, uh, do you have anything to add on this? Why did PCAST uh, recommend against legislation? Uh, I cannot spe speak for PCAST, just as Mr. Allen can, but, but for my own perspective and that from NORD is our perspective is that it was premature. It merits exploration, but at this time, you know, trying to integrate that and come up with a system, we didn't have a program in front of us that had enough uh, granularity for us to speak to it uh, with any confidence. So I think that this is in the uh, exploratory world. I appreciate that. Let me, uh, Mr. Chairman, just briefly mention one other critical issue that deserves a hearing in and of itself. We need new therapies to be marketed, but we've got to address high prices for these therapies. There are no good, uh, there are no, they are no good for anyone if we can't afford them. And I have a recent article from the New York Times that describes the hardships faced by patients with chronic diseases who can't afford the price of their treatments. It notes that the high prices of treatments for diabetes and other chronic diseases are a major contributor to the U.S. $2.7 trillion annual health bill. This is an issue we will have to address at some point, and I'd ask unanimous consent this article be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Chair, thanks the uh, gentleman, and now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to you all. Um, uh, the state I represent, New Jersey, represented as well by uh, uh, Ranking Member Pallone, is certainly among the medicine chests of the world and a center of significant biomedical innovation. We are the proud home to tens of thousands of jobs in these life-saving industries. These companies reinvest hundreds of millions of dollars each year back into R&D, 
in order to bring much needed therapies uh, to, to patients to market. Uh, I am deeply concerned about the slashing of R&D budgets that may look good on a financial spreadsheet, uh, but uh, I think would be tragic for, for patients moving forward. I ask this out of a concern regarding recent news uh, on certain uh, potential acquiring companies' intentions to slash R&D spending. For example, in the case of Allergan, a company that provides hundreds of jobs in the congressional district I serve. A potential uh, a buyer of, of Allergan has stated that it, it can achieve cost synergies by cutting approximately $1 billion in investment in R&D and eliminate 5,000 high-quality U.S. jobs as well as lower its tax rate from 26 percent to low single digits. Companies like Allergan invest significant capital in R&D in order to continue to develop treatments for unmet medical needs. These investments not only support high-skilled, well-paying jobs, but also continue to deliver new, potentially life-saving products in the development pipeline. I am concerned that this could become the model for other such mergers and we would lose the engine for innovation and growth here in the United States. Uh, to you, Ms. Radcliffe, how dependent are future cures on robust commitments in the private sector uh, to research and development? Thank you. So Bio is unable to comment on any particular companies. Uh, yes, I, I realize that, but in we're general, We're not please. familiar with that. Um, I, I personally am not familiar with uh, the f situation specifically in the case that you mentioned to make any comment whatsoever. Um, obviously, the mission of Bio is to ensure um, that there is a, research, a robust research and development pipeline in the United States for the development of new cures that will help patients and meet unmet medical needs. Um, and uh, do you believe that the level of uh, uh, research and development now in this country, in, in private companies, that in general that is the level that should continue and perhaps even increase? Again, not commenting on any specific company because there are, uh, may, every individual company may have its own situation with respect to exactly the level of research and development um, that it is conducting as opposed to research and development that it licenses in or, or that are, are conducted in partnerships and so forth. However, um, I think that it, for bio, uh, again, the um, level of research and development in the United States is extremely important. As I said in my testimony, it's very important that we as a nation continue to elevate our research and development for the purposes of meeting unmet medical needs for patients and also um, in terms of global competitiveness. So in general, you favor more research <laughs> development funding as opposed to uh, fewer funds in, 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 in that portion of the larger whole. As a general principle, yes, and yes. of course it would matter as to how that research and development, uh, how that research and development funding were specifically spent. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the, uh, the panel in general, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology states that one of the most powerful incentives for drug development is granting periods of exclusivity to new drugs. It also mentions the economic disincentives created by long clinical trials required for conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. The President's Council acknowledges that engaging in the economic analyses required to provide potential policy changes is beyond the scope of the report and outside core experience. That being said, Hatch-Waxman was enacted in 1984 and it is indisputable that the time and cost it takes to develop a drug has significantly increased over the course of the last three decades. There are many potential therapies that would address other unmet medical needs, such as rare diseases and mental health areas in which I am involved, I am the Republican chair of the Rare Disease Caucus, that lack sufficient patent protection. To the panel in general, what are your thoughts on using data exclusivity to address these issues? You know, first on behalf of NORD, I want to acknowledge the Congressman Lance's leadership in the Congressional Caucus on Rare Diseases. Thank you very much. And, uh, we, we've, we've so awarded you, you know, uh, on, on behalf of your leadership in that area. And we, we believe that the, uh, um, uh, that the, uh, 
the, uh, the ability of, of all, uh, let's say, the Orphan Drug Exclusivity Act had a tremendous uh, incentive that, uh, that uh, has sparked uh, a great deal of research and development for rare diseases. Uh, you heard even Dr. Neal mention that his company is moving in the area of rare diseases, uh, maybe in part because of the economic incentive that's provided by the Orphan Drug Act. So uh, these kind of incentives have been powerful. Every person or every organization that's examined it has found their utility. The question, though, that is sometimes raised, Congressman Lance, is should we, for instance, expand the exclusivity? Should we uh, enter into the orphan drug exclusivity now that we have other forms of protections that exceed seven years, perhaps in order to uh, uh, reestablish the primacy of orphan drug exclusivity, that should be extended beyond seven years. So these questions have been raised, and, and they're serious questions that I think that uh, merit further discussion. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, five minutes for questions. Mr. Allen, you, uh, you indicated it's hard to legislate or to come up with a, a good legislative model when you have uh, all these different diseases and you have some which are uh, fatal and quickly fatal, others which are chronic. Uh, don't you think simpler might be better and that maybe Mr. Sazanowski's uh, chart might be of some help in that regard? Absolutely. And I think uh, that was uh, what was intended and, and what the committee enacted uh, through the Breakthrough Therapies designation, a, a very simple requirement of, uh, of early clinical activity showing a substantial improvement that results in a very flexible, intensive collaboration uh, to get that drug through the process. And sometimes we, we get fancy. We like to do things that are more complicated. Mr. Sazanowski, you want to talk about your chart again for a minute? Somebody might not have been watching earlier. Well, well thank you, uh, Congressman Griffin. As, as a fellow Virginian, I appreciate that. I'm holding up a paper clip. Sometimes a paper clip can do an awful lot of good. And so I've been involved in this area of, of drug innovation, like I said, for more than three decades. And I've wrestled with this question of what can we do as uh, to, to achieve what we all want to achieve, like to accelerate approvals. And, and, and when I've been involved in this process, um, I see how often, shockingly, these very simple concepts that the Congress has created, such as Fast Track, you know, are not considered. And if we just give them more visibility, it sounds so simple, but if we required that at every um, new therapy that were to come before the FDA, there would be a simple question put, is this therapy one that would be a candidate for accelerated approval? It wouldn't take hardly any resources to consider that. It wouldn't delay at all the, the review of it, but it might spark the very kind of thing that others around the table here have talked to, that if we're going to engage in accelerated approval, we have to start that engagement early in order to identify intermediate clinical endpoints and identify surrogates that can be used. And so since we're not recognizing the utility of it until at all very late in the process, we lose that, we forfeit that opportunity. So thank you, Congressman, for recognizing that. Uh, I appreciate that. I uh, ask you to put on your thinking caps. Don't necessarily uh, expect an answer today, but if you can think of what other legal barriers are out there that are currently limiting the potential for doctors, researchers, researchers, drug companies to communicate on how therapies are working for patients in the real world and, and what can we do to break down some of those legal barriers that are preventing uh, reasonable and valuable treatments from getting to the patients. If you have an answer today, I'd be glad to hear it. I've got about two minutes of my time left if you want to use it. If not, if you could submit uh, ideas uh, for the record, I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, Congressman, if, yes, if one thing, I'm not sure about the legal, even though I'm a lawyer, I'm not sure about the legal impediment. I'll have to think about this further. But many of you, the members of this committee have suggested issues that where natural histories or registries could be a very valuable tool. If we understood more about the natural history of progression of a disease, we could better understand how it might work in a small population. We could be able to discern what is the treatment benefit versus what is the natural course of disease. And in the same way, we can tell, separate what is a safety signal that's a true safety signal that might be due to the therapy from just a signal 
that is part of the natural course of the progression of the disease. So these natural histories and registries are very important. We, on behalf of NORD, have been encouraging the development of them in every area, and there are difficulties in trying to get physicians and trying to get medical institutions uh, to be able to share information and to be able to have uniform information so that we're not talking about apples and oranges. We need some sort of common lexicon in these areas. So I don't have the specific answer of what are the legal aspects of that, right. but I, I know what the target should be. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, if anyone would like my time, if not, I yield back. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. Now, recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, five minutes for question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel for being here today um, on this uh, very important issue. Um, I represent the Second District of North Carolina, and in um, our district, um, we have 70,000 veterans, and I'm very proud to represent them. Um, many of them are returning home uh, from Afghanistan, um, and certainly have, have come home from Iraq, um, and living in, in our communities with um, PTSD. And I'm, I know that's, that's something that you're all aware of. Um, I understand that new path-breaking technologies are emerging in treating veterans with PTSD, specifically the use of mag magnetic resonance therapy. Do you know, and this, uh, Dr. Neal, this is, this is a question for you. Do you know if the Department of Veterans Affairs has looked into any of these new technologies, um, in particular um, into the magnetic resonance therapy treatment? Uh, thanks, Mrs. Elmers. Uh, uh, no, I do not know that. Okay. Um, there again, getting into the issue of um, how we need to move forward um, on many of these treatments, you know, such as uh, PTSD. In the, you know, there's there's broad agreement um, that the you know the present system that we have with clinical trials is is ineffective and and costly. Um, there was a, an expert that participated in the PCAS report that estimated um, a more efficient clinical trial system could cut the costs in half across the industry. Uh, Dr. Neal, do you have any thoughts on what we can do to make trials more efficient and less expensive, and what would this mean to the R&D budgets across the industry? Uh, thank you again. Uh, First of all, I'll just say that it would have a huge impact because more than 40 percent of industrial R&D expenditure is in the area of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that, that we formed Transcelerate Biomedical as an industry collaboration was to address clinical trials inefficiency. And there we, we looked at this and said these are areas where we do not have and cannot really realize any competitive advantage and we're all spending the same money over and over again to basically reconstruct a clinical trials mm -hmm. infrastructure every time. We're all using the same investigators. We're all training the investigators, and then we're not recognizing each other's training. We, we all have our own website to communicate with it, and so on and so forth. And so we took that on, and, and the early results are very promising as a way to be able to increase a lot of efficiency, reduce the burden on clinical investigators, mm -hmm. and reduce the cost. I think there are a lot of other great examples, the cystic fibrosis example being one of them with their clinical trials network, where specific disease or disease-specific networks can be created so you become plug and play by being able to start these trials very quickly. And this new lung cancer master protocol, I think, is a great innovation uh, in that direction. So taken all together, I, I believe there's an enormous amount of efficiency on the table. There are a lot of things in my testimony that I specifically recommended around IRBs, safety monitoring boards, clinical trial networks, and, and new innovative approaches to this, like, again, in, in your state at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, their collaboration with the NIH, mm -hmm. with the collaboratory. So they're exploring ways to be able to randomize using electronic health records and, and test different therapies. I think we need to explore all of that. And there's no doubt that we will, we will have the greatest impact on accelerating these cures to patients, reducing costs, and making the whole system work better if we can take that on. And I think Congress could do a lot here. Thank you, Dr. Neal. 
Um, let me see, time about a minute left. Um, Dr. Tunis, um, I have a question to, uh, and it gets back to the issue that that's, that um, that has been asked a number of times on, you know, how much of the patient involvement um, is is taken into account, especially in the FDA, um, when it comes to uh, moving forward in an accelerated fashion. What, you know, how does in how does the, the FDA view the, the patient um, input on some of these some of these issues? I'm certainly aware that there's um, you know a couple of focused initiatives going on at the FDA that are really trying to enhance the degree to which patient perspectives are taken into account. There's the patient focused drug development that uh, I believe uh, came out of the FDAMA was uh, and uh, FDASIA was okay. Um, and then on, in the, actually in the Center for Devices, there's um, uh, a medical device innovation collaborative that's very much focusing on patient perspectives on benefit risk, very much with the notion that, it, you know, one of the potential delays in, in product development is what level of concern or what willingness are, ha, patients have to tolerate risk and, uh, and, and whether the regulators and the regulators' perspective on that is different from the patients. And I think there's a view that, um, the patients are probably or may be in many cases willing to tolerate um, more risk, particularly in serious and life-threatening illnesses. So it seems to me, you know, from my observations, that there's a lot of recognition um, that, that the patient perspective is important, and the difficulty is, you know, capturing it both, you know, individually and aggregately. And how do you make a regulatory process that might even have to be adjustable based on individual patient preferences for balancing benefits and risks. So the interest is there, but I think it's um, complicated. It is complicated, and, you know, certainly liability plays into um, all of this as well. Um, it looks to Mr. me Mr. you, you yes, really want to comment on this. I, I do, would like because, because Congress deserves a great deal of credit in, as the, the lawyer understands drug law. 1906 drug law was created. It never mentioned no law until Fidesia ever mentioned patient. It was assumed that laws could be created in order to enable a regulator to look at what the medical industry and the drug industry produced in some sort of paternalistic way for patients. Mm -hmm. Now I'm speaking on behalf of Nord, who represents mm -hmm. 30 million Americans with rare diseases. And so we're so pleased that this Congress in Fidesia introduced the concept for the first time that the patient voice is meaningful has a role in drug development. And that's why you had the patient-focused drug development, the structured benefit-risk ratio. The, the FDA said we can now impanel, the FDA law said, impanel patients in part of the FDA internal review team as special government employers. Tiffany House with Pompeii disease did that for a drug for Pompeii. And the FDA reviewers later, when I talked to them, I said, what did you learn from having a patient for the first time as part of your internal review team? They said, we learned that for a patient with a relentlessly progressive deteriorating disease, that for that patient to be stable was a huge win. So the role of the patient is now emergent, and it's due to this Congress. So I just couldn't avoid taking the time to say thank you. Thank, thank you um, to the panel, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we went over our time, but I really could not um, avoid hearing hearing those th those thanks and appreciation words. Um, so much of what we typically do not hear. So thank you, Chair. Thanks, gentlelady, and thank you for uh, your remarks. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. McMorris Rogers. Five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would any of you, and, and maybe specifically Ms. Radcliffe or Dr. Neal, uh, speak to the bureaucratic or regulatory burdens faced in starting or conducting clinical trials? And, and when was the last time at, that we, as a nation or Congress, addressed the regulatory framework which governs how clinical trials are conducted? And do you think it's time for an update, given new technologies we can now bring to bear? Yes, I, I, I do think that this is an, an important issue, as I, as I said uh, previously, um, which is impacting the speed of development and its cost, especially, and also its effectiveness. So I, I do think this is worth a, a reexamination. I think there are a lot of things that we could potentially do at the statutory level. And here I'm, th I'm thinking about um, 
standardized contracts for investigators, uh, institutional review boards, safety monitoring boards, which could be set up at the national or regional level rather than the inefficiencies of having to establish these at every uh, institution and not having people who are necessarily uh, as professionally qualified and, and experienced in monitoring these types of studies as they could be uh, as examples. And, and I think that working through public-private partnerships or possibly authorizing additional money through the NIH to allow these trial networks to be established would also uh, be a great help. Yes, I recommend uh, Dr. Neal's testimony as a fairly comprehensive list of some of the things that could be done to um, uh, expedite clinical trials. Um, for bio specifically, we have um, launched an initiative to look at four things. One is central IRBs. Um, that is to streamline the review of protocols and when uh, they ex uh, extend over multiple um, academic centers. Um, the qualification process for drug development tools such as biomarkers, and we've talked a little bit about that earlier in this hearing. Um, clinical trial networks, one of the, um, the great advantages of establishing clinical trial networks is to speed up the patient recruitment process, which today is very much longer than it has been in the past, and so we could really make great inroads to addressing that issue. And finally, adopting a risk-based approach to clinical trial monitoring using centralized monitoring mechanisms. So, so those are four areas where we really want to make some progress at BIO over the coming years. Thank you, thank you. Um, like many, I've been following the story of an innovative company, 23andMe, which developed a DNA testing kit that allows individuals to see which diseases or conditions they may have a predisposition to. And it seems to me that alerting individuals that they are more likely to have a certain disease or condition is a good thing. And it could be something that aids d the development of new and innovative cures. For example, the genetic makeup of an in individual who carries the gene for Huntington's disease but does not suffer from the symptoms could be analyzed to determine what is his specific biology that stunts the development of that awful, awful disease. So the question, are products like this making a major step towards personalized medicine and uh, tailor-made cures? And what does it mean for millions of people to be able to have crowdsourced, to be able to crowdsource their genetic information? Anyone that may want to answer? I'll answer. We are, um, in the biotechnology industry, we are extremely excited about the potential for uh, the use of genetic information in the, um, the design of clinical trials, in the um, ex expediting of those clinical trials, and also in healthcare delivery to help physicians and patients understand the best course of action. I think it's also important to understand, though, that information needs to be delivered in a way um, that enables um, the best decision making by patients. A very specific example is that um, a patient might receive information about a risk of a certain type of cancer and take action on that um, in a, a way that really would be detrimental to that person's health. And so as all of this wonderful information comes out and as it's made available more broadly, we also have to um, put a great deal of thought toward the, the context for delivering that health information in a way that is helpful and not harmful. And then would you speak to the, the role that FDA is playing in the process and has FDA promoted the development of these kinds of diagnostic tests? Is F is the FDA approval process adequately equipped to consider these types of products? This is an area where bio has um, worked for a long time with FDA. Um, the, the products that are coming out are so novel and so different from those that have been um, reviewed by FDA in the past that uh, they really require a, a different kind of scrutiny and different expertise. Um, FDA has done a lot to improve that regulatory process and to ensure that it has the expertise internally um, to manage these new technologies. I think that in the future, uh, there will be a need for FDA to continue evolving to make sure that it's keeping up with the pace of scientific advances. 
thank you. Uh, and I too want to thank the panel and for everyone for participating. I'm, I am very excited about this 21st Century Cures initiative, like, like everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. And I recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each of you for taking the time to be here. And um, I apologize that we've been jumping up and down from the first floor where we have Chairman Wheeler with the FCC with a hearing going on. And I know for some of your groups, uh, having access to broadband for some of the new medical apps, for telemedicine concepts, things of that nature is very important. It's important to us also. So we have been in and out of that uh, hearing. I've been pleased to catch some of the comments about clinical trials and looking at those uh, meaningful outcomes, bringing patients into that process. And we were discussing this in uh, our office this morning. Dr. Summer, who is, uh, does our health policy in the office, and I were talking about how important that is to have that impact. And my experience, you know, you've got health professionals like Ms. Elmers and Dr. Cassidy and Dr. Burgess that are on this panel. But I've come from the other side as a, a community volunteer who was chairman of the board for the Lung Association on the Heart Board, the Arthritis Board, uh, Children's Hospital, uh, those components there in Nashville. and. Uh, realizing as we put the emphasis on uh, different participation for managing disease like asthma and the outreach we did with the Lung Association, how important it was to hear from those parents and those patients of how different protocols and therapies affected them and what the outcome was and the importance of finding something that worked. And uh, Dr. Radcliffe, I think it's the reason it was so um, when I went to the State Senate in Tennessee, I took the initiative of working with a colleague and we pulled together a biotechnology task force to begin to look for some of those personalizations that can come about uh, in the medical field for treating uh, these the diseases that, that impact us. So I have enjoyed hearing your comments today and appreciate that you all would take your time. Uh, just one more question I want to add uh, to the mix here. And Dr. Allen, I'm going to come to you on this. We've had a little bit of discussion this morning as we have looked at Section 903 in FIDASIA and uh, being able to pull those external experts into the process. And of course, the conflict of interest, things of that nature, always has, has been such a problem. But I, I think that uh, for those of you who are medical professionals and for those uh, like me who want to find answers and uh, find a way to cure uh, some of these diseases, having that participation is vitally important. And so I would just ask you, how how is the FDA doing as it comes to the involvement and in making it possible for some of these experts to openly participate, be full participants in this process, which is what we're going to have to have if we get to some of these answers? Right, so I, I think some of the panelists have already commented on uh, bringing uh, the FDA's efforts and bringing uh, patient expertise to the process and how uh, important that is in addition to uh, Section 903 that you mentioned, bringing uh, subject matter experts into the review process. Um, and I think that was a very important component of FIDASIA to uh, expand on activities that the FDA um, was already doing and, and might be able to even uh, enhance through 903 and making sure that there were diverse experts in, in in really subsets of specialties like rare diseases or in different genetic uh, diseases to make sure that they had access to them. You know, again, this goes back to resources. In a very resource-constrained agency, um, they, they simply will never have all of these experts, and particularly as, as medical therapy becomes more and more uh, uh, diverse and, and specialized. Um, 
so I think the uh, Section 903 provides uh, one way to uh, allow experts to be more involved in review, and, and I think we all can agree that we'd like to see the FDA continue to implement that uh, as rapidly as possible. I, I think even there's opportunity beyond just, uh, just Section 903, um, which is really focused on involving expertise in the review process. But even things with, with not just the specific review, for things like developing best practices and guidance documents, uh, there's a real opportunity to also call on those experts and those patients to make sure that they're able to contribute uh, to, to the many uh, diverse and, and important things um, that the FDA is charged with carrying out. And um, they continue to have, have more and more responsibility and uh, unfortunately not the resources to go along with that. So this is one way to help open those doors. We'll continue to hold them accountable. Thank you, sir. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engels, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, and thank you, Ranking Member Pallone, for holding today's hearing. Uh, I'm pleased that this uh, committee is focusing its efforts on the 21st Century Cures Initiative and the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, the PCAST Report on Drug Innovation. Um, I believe that some of the best work that this Congress did during the 112th Congress was in working together to pass FIDESIA. I've always been proud to serve on this committee because of the tremendous impact laws that originate within this committee can have on medical research and disease treatments. 21st Century Cures Initiative proves that this committee's commitment to getting new treatments into the hands of patients as quickly and safely as possible remains strong. So let me ask you, Dr. Neal, in your written testimony, you suggested that Congress target its efforts in several different ways, one of which, and I quote you, was to ensure that the FDA has adequate resources to do their job. Uh, I think it's critical the FDA, that the FDA does have adequate funding and staff resources in place in order to meet the demands of increasingly complicated and advanced medical therapies. I know there was significant frustration last year when sequestration caused $85 million in pharmaceutical and medical device company paid user fees to be unavailable to the FDA. Um, fortunately, the FY 2014 Omnibus Appropriations Act restored the ability and the availability of these funds to the, to the FDA. Um, however, uh, beyond funding, uh, Dr. Uh, Neal, you mentioned that, and again I'm quoting you, new trial designs and clinical endpoints will require collaborative efforts with academics and patient advocacy groups, unquote. So could you elaborate on how academics and patient advocacy groups can better assist the FDA with the resources they need to meet the demands of 21st century medical treatments? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Neal. Um, I, I believe that FDA should be given more resources so that they can engage consultants, convene meetings with outside experts, and also with patient advocacy groups to a greater extent. And I also think part of their this new resource allocation that they might get beyond their base budget funding could allow them to hire more staff that could engage with small companies along the way to be able to guide them through the process more efficiently. I think they don't have enough money right now to be able to support the sort of scientific work that they need to do. In other words, there, there could be a lot more scholarship and original research in the areas of regulatory science that impinges on all of this inside the FDA, both an intramural and extramural program. And also the ability, just, just simple things like being able to travel to scientific meetings, I know that that's constrained right now too. And all of these things would help them to be able to create a more scientific culture internally, to be apprised of the latest uh, advances in science, and to be able to incorporate that as, as they need to in, in their review process. Well, thank you. Um, I mentioned to Dr. Woodcock uh, during our last FIDESIA hearing in November 2013, um, but I'm particularly interested in the development and approval of drugs for rare diseases. Um, I'm the co-author of the Paul D. Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Community Assistance Research and Education Amendments of 2008 and 2013. Did it in conjunction with our colleague, Representative Burgess. Uh, and one of the aspects of FIDESIA uh, I am most interested in is the improvements made to the various expedited approval pathways and the establishment of the breakthrough therapy pathway. 
Uh, to me, uh, diseases like muscular dystrophy are why the expedited approval pathways are so important. Uh, one type of muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is the most common lethal genetic disorder of children worldwide, affecting one in every 3,500 live male births. There's no cure. It's always fatal and often at a young age. So the best hope for those with Duchenne is to treat the symptoms and delay its progression. Uh, however, in recent years, the muscular dystrophy research pipeline uh, has held uh, much promise as potentially life-saving therapies appear on the horizon, some of which are a result of Congress's efforts to improve research into this spectrum of muscle weakening diseases through the MD Care Act, which was first passed and signed into law in 2001. So it would appear to me that establishing quality intermediate endpoints that can add value to future trials is vital for experimental medications to be considered under the various expedited approval pathways. So my question is recognizing the significant challenges that exist in developing therapies within the rare disease space. How can the FDA, NIH, drug companies, and patient advocacy, advocacy organizations better work together to ensure proper parameters for success and failure being established through the clinical trial process? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, Congressman Engel, I, I uh, couldn't applaud you more for your work in the area and uh, with the MD Care Act and, and others for reaching out to these communities of uh, patients with rare diseases. So thank you for your work in that area. Um, I think that my testimony, my written testimony, I tried to describe what I thought would be four proposals that would advance the interests of those with rare diseases. Um, I think number one is you know, to, again, have FDA uh, use accelerated approval more often. As I noted in my written testimony in my oral statement uh, earlier, that when we looked at all of the use of accelerated approval since FDA started it for the AIDS crisis in the mid-'80s through June 2013, there were only 19 drug therapies that the FDA had approved with that pathway that were not for cancer and not for AIDS. So it has to be used for these rare diseases, because in these rare diseases, we're looking, just as you said, Congressman, we're looking for something, an endpoint in a trial design that is something short of the ultimate clinical benefit. We don't want to have a clinical trial that's going to follow DMD boys all the time until the, they lose ambulation, and that is the ultimate clinical benefit. And we don't have the luxury to design clinical trials because we don't have enough boys and we don't have enough time. So we need to establish these other endpoints. And I think accelerated approval would help us do it. And I think this committee has done a great deal in FIDASIA. And I think that there's more, though, that can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. I recognize the uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, five minutes for questions. Um, I'm sorry, I came in late, so someone has already act, answered this. Several of you, and I think the PCAST recommendations speak of in, increased NIH funding and decry the fact that since 2003 there's been some decline. And the reality is we have constrained federal, federal resources. So with that context, uh, there was an IOM report or GAO, I can't recall, from about 20 years ago suggesting that the NIH should repri reprioritize its funding uh, priorities and, and re better reflect uh, current needs. Uh, frankly, I think when I looked at it a couple years ago, they had not done so. Now, do you have any thoughts on whether or not the NIH is appropriately allocating its resources to our current funding needs? I look at Alzheimer's, I think it may be getting $600 million, but the cost of future Alzheimer's uh, is huge. Ms. Radcliffe, do you have any thoughts just to call upon you? Sure. So thank you for uh, highlighting the importance of continuing to fund the NIH. As you noted, the, the uh, yes, I got, I got, I got that. But, but yeah. frankly, we don't have enough money. So, so my real question is, my pointed question is, does the NIH need to reallocate some of its assets? Because again, the IOM suggested this 20 years ago. I'm not sure it's been done since. Yeah. So uh, we have been extremely supportive of a new center at NIH called the uh, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences (NCATS). And uh, we are extremely interested in supporting the work of that in, uh, center uh, because it will more directly lead to. I, I hear what you're saying. I have limited time, so that's not really what I'm asking. Dr. Neal, any comments upon what I just suggested? I, I think they're doing a very good job, actually, in, in prioritizing at the moment. Um, one, 
wishes that one could predict where important discoveries were going to come from. But now, let me ask you, it isn't so much to predict important discoveries. It's the fact that we have this incredible challenge of neuro, neuro, neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases. I mean, that's just out there. Right. And if you look at what we're funding that with relative to other diseases uh, and, and the future cost, which is easily predicted, uh, it, it seems mm, perhaps, again, a different priority than others would select if you could just start over. So, so any specific, again, people may be hesitant to criticize the NIH, but if we're asking for more funding, we have to also know they're using their funding wisely. Yeah. I, I just wish that, that one could, again, really think about how to prioritize and manage it, but we don't know where a discovery in a completely different area that affects mitochondria or who knows what may be the breakthrough that we need in neurodegenerative diseases. You're suggesting that we need to have no direction whatsoever. I, mean, I, I, think, I'm, I think that's what I'm hearing from you, but rather rely upon kind of basic research to, to, to produce. Well, I, I don't think it's just that, but I think that the most promising basic research needs to be funded if we're going to continue to advance. Uh, Mr. Sasanowski, um, any thoughts? Yeah, it, it, with your particular concern about uh, neurological, neurodegenerative diseases, yeah, a large swath of the rare diseases in this country fit into that category. And, and as you know, Dr. Neal just mentioned, you know, the uh, underpinnings, the pathophysiology of many of those go back to mitochondrial energy production. So if we can have reallocation of NIH funds that would redirect it to some of these areas that have the promise of being able to address a lot of diseases, that might be a worthwhile endeavor. Seems like we should have some metric. What is the future cost? What is current morbidity? And have it reflect that. Uh, Dr. Tunis, you know, I used to do medical research. My nurse, uh, who I worked with, who basically told me what to do when I showed up, said, man, the paperwork has increased dramatically over the years. Now, one of the recommendations, I think number seven, suggests that maybe FDA could be more efficient in terms of how it does its process. I'm asking you just to ask, it could be anyone. How would you grade what FDA has done in terms of is, is the monitoring process thoroughly useful or is some of it kind of, oh my gosh, why in the heck are we doing this? It's just driving up cost. Any kind of, a, any kind of grade you would give FDA for their current efforts? Um, well, I think uh, <clears throat> I'd hate to grade FDA, but I, I think FDA actually recognizes that there is a lot of this excessive uh, um, uh, activities and cost I embedded in clinical trials. And one of the things, uh, you know, Gary and others know a lot about is they do have this partnership with Duke called the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, which is systematically trying to identify where there are, you know, excessive regulatory burdens, things that contribute to the inefficiency of clinical research. And you know, doing uh, you know, exploring how those things could be minimized. So I'd I'd give the FDA an A grade in terms of identifying that there are opportunities to improve and having at least that forum to uh, uh, you know to look for solutions. And I don't know if Gary, you wanted to add anything to that. Well, the, the monitoring is a, is a particular issue that we took on with Transcelerate, and FDA provided input into that. And we know that we're overdoing this in ways that are not really adding value, maybe subtracting value and driving cost. So moving to a more risk-based monitoring approach, again, with, with FDA. Any sense of how much cost that adds, 5 percent, 10 percent marginal cost of it, monitoring, which may be, may be inefficient? It, it depends on the trial, obviously, but, but uh, and I, I can't give you a precise estimate, but it's very substantial. Very substantial. Very substantial. Okay. Uh, that was kind of my impression from being front line way back when. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the first round of questioning. We're going to go to one follow-up per side, and I'll recognize Dr. Burgess, five minutes for his follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, I want to thank the panel for, for being here. It's been a bit of a long morning, but a very informative morning. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge, uh, I guess, uh, my co-sponsor, Elliot Engel, has, has left, but the MD CARES Act, Mr. Chairman, that is a, a good bill and one that we, I hope we can have a legislative hearing and a markup on before we get too deep in the political season because it's one that, that needs to occur. And in fact, the last reauthorization, we haven't addressed the problem that occurs that we're doing such a good job that some of these patients are now living to early adulthood when they didn't before, and the current act does not address young adults with the, with the illness, and we need to do that. So I hope we can have that legislative hearing. I also, um, Mr. Sanoskowski, I don't want to correct you, but it was actually the last Congress that passed FIDASIA. 
<laughs> but, but but it was this committee that that did the that did the work, and I just wanted to to acknowledge the work of Brian Bilbray, who's no longer with us. And really, it was his. I mean, he was a bulldog on the surrogate endpoints when FDA was in testifying before this committee, and without. Ryan Bilbray's co uh, contribution. I don't think Fidesia would have been as effective. And uh, of course, the uh, I certainly it, I appreciated hearing this morning about the uh, the conflicts, the trying to improve the status of the conflicts language so that we could improve the advisory panels that we impanel to to advise the FDA on on approvals. Look, one of the things that the President's Council did come up with and, and talk about was the woeful state of the information technology of the Food and Drug Administration. You hear the urban legends about the warehouses of new drug applications that are in boxes on paper applications in the basement somewhere. I don't know whether it's true or not because I've never, I've never seen it, but can anyone speak? I guess there's been the, the hiring of a, a new chief information officer. Uh, do, does anybody see uh, any any daylight on the horizon there? Apparently not. Um, well, let me just tell you what's so frustrating. This committee, this committee for the last, I've been on the committee for 10 years, and we've had this discussion over and over and over again. As a practicing physician, I have received the slings and arrows because Doctors' offices are not coming into the information age rapidly enough, and here we got the FDA, which is just stumbling all over itself. I mean, surely there's something we can do about that to digitize the data. I mean, if this were a class action lawsuit, the large litigation firms around the country would get together, digitize the data, and analyze it in a weekend, and, and we can't do it as a federal agency? I don't know. Surely somebody has some thoughts on, on, on how to improve this system. Again, uh, the, let the for the clerk's benefit. No one volunteered an answer. Uh, I, I just I, I acknowledge this is something that needs to be fixed. I, I appreciate Dr. Cassidy's comments about the funding constraints, but if we don't fix this, we're we're not getting out of this problem. I do want to uh, ask Mr. Sanoskowski, um Probably the the one thing I've heard this morning that I'm going to take with me out of this hearing is that. Perhaps the default position at the FDA ought to be the accelerated pathway. And the FDA historically has been risk averse, but you're talking about a new world order where the FDA now defaults to the accelerated pathway. So can you speak to accelerated approval as, as the default in the future? Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Burgess. That, that the, it, it, I don't see it as a default. I don't see most of the therapies uh, coming through the FDA's uh, gauntlet being uh, approved under accelerated approval because it only fits for those which are serious diseases where there's an unmet medical need. But what I'm saying is that uh, those twin criteria could apply to many diseases, especially the rare diseases, that are, the 7,000 rare diseases that affect Americans. And so for those, you know, that should be part of the discussion at the beginning, at the pre-IND meeting, when we're first coming into the FDA. That should be part of that engagement, because you've heard several other witnesses, and it was also in Fidesia and PCAS, that said, if you're going to go forward with accelerated approval, you have to start that discussion early, because you have to be able to identify the surrogate endpoints or the intermediate clinical endpoints so that you can run the studies in the proper way. And so that discussion is not going on. So what I was suggesting, uh, Dr. Burgess, is that every time that a new therapy is proposed to the agency, one of the first questions always be, as part of their checkbox, well, is this a candidate for accelerated approval? Would this fit? Is this a serious disease for which there's an unmet medical need? And then the system can integrate that. And, and it's, it's currently just not being considered. Not only is it not being considered, but I, I will just tell you, not a month goes by that someone's not in my office with a tale of woe yes. about getting their drug or device approved. And I am, I for one, in this committee, I'm just tired of hitting my head against that wall. And it is time for us to break through or break out of that modality and move into the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the questions. Uh, at this point, the members will have follow-up questions. We ask that you please respond promptly. Uh, this has been a very informative uh, hearing. We appreciate your sharing your expertise with us and the practical recommendations. I remind members that they will have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. Uh, members should submit their questions by the close of business on Tuesday, 
June 3rd. With that objection, subcommittee is adjourned.